In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26 verse 46. 26 46. And uh, this is after our Lord had made his uh, personal prayers and for self-comfort, of course, and also utilizing the faith rest drill and utilizing the power of doctrine. Now, uh, when we get, uh, what we're going to go through now is we're going to see uh, Jesus Christ to go through some things, and then it's going to switch from Jesus Christ to Peter, and then back to Jesus Christ, and then back to Peter. And the reason why Matthew does this is he is comparing and contrasting the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ utilized the prototype spiritual life while Matthew, while uh, Peter did not. Now he doesn't even mention Peter by name, that is Matthew doesn't, because Matthew wrote this in 68 AD. And Peter was still alive when Matthew wrote his account of all of this. So out of courtesy and out of uh, the fact that he respected Peter and the fact that he didn't want to be seen as gossiping, he did not mention Peter whatsoever in terms of Peter being the one betraying Christ. And he doesn't even mention his name. Very discreet. However, we know it's Peter because of uh, the fact that John, who wrote his his epistle in 96 A.D., uh, and along with the others, uh, the fact that John wrote in 96 A.D., then therefore uh, he could write about Peter because Peter was dead. He was in heaven by that time. So we see a comparison and contrast between our Lord utilizing the Word of God and Peter utilizing sincerity. And Peter was very sincere, and we're going to see a lot of that today. Now in 2646 it says, Get up! Now the Greek actually has more to say about it. It says, Get up and get going! And actually the implication is that Jesus knew they would fail. And not just Peter, but all of them are going to fail. All the disciples, all 11 of them, and of course Judas Iscariot is the unbeliever in the group. Get up and get going. Let us go. Look, my betrayer is here. In other words, uh, get up. The betrayer is here. Let him do what he has to do. My time has come. And uh, the, the, fact, the point we can get out of this is the fact that Jesus knew. Jesus knew all the 11, 12 disciples. He knew that Judas Iscariot would betray him. And he knew that the 11 would all scatter as soon as, uh, as, soon as he was captured. They would uh, move into a state of fear and all scatter to the wind. Yet he still picked them as his disciples. And in fact, uh, later on, they would be the eleven apostles, and then would come along the apostle Paul, who would be the twelfth. So he knew they would fail, every single one of them. Yet he picked these people as his disciples. And that means grace. And the principle we can get out of this is that God's plan is greater than our weaknesses. God's plan is greater than our weaknesses. Even though Peter and all the rest of them are going to run away, God's plan is going to go on unaffected. Jesus Christ is going to go to the cross even though Peter doesn't want Him to. Jesus Christ is going to go to the cross even though all of his so-called friends and his students and disciples, all of them are going to scatter, he's still going to the cross. And God's plan is going to go on no matter what their weaknesses. And God's plan goes on no matter what our weaknesses. 
And all of us fail. And all of us have weaknesses. But that has to do with the grace of God. And the fact that in eternity past, God knew all of our failures. God knew all of our sins. God knew everything about us in eternity past. And in spite of all that, His plan goes on. Now what legalism does is says that uh, legalism says that uh, God's plan won't make it without me. Unless I give 10% to the church, God's plan ain't going to make it. God's plan ain't going to fly. Unless I witness to 50 people, then uh, no, the people, then I'll be responsible. You know, some people even think this way, that if they don't witness to 100 people a day, that they will be responsible for the fact that uh, those uh, people who they did not witness to are going to hell. And that is complete arrogance. God's plan sees to it that anyone who seeks the gospel message will receive it by whatever means God allows them to receive it, and they will receive it. Whether And it doesn't depend on us, it depends on God. And legalism switches it around and says all of, the, all of this stuff that goes on depends on us. And whether people get uh, go to heaven or go to hell even depends on us, etc. And that is great arrogance and great legalism. And Peter was involved in that, and so were the twelve. And they were very sincere many times, or actually all the time, very sincere. And they loved our Lord and were sincere about their love for Him, knowing Him for approximately three years, seeing His grace, seeing the miracles, seeing everything else. Yet they didn't have a lot of doctrine, so they were still very emotional. And when you don't have doctrine, you're going to be emotional. And when you, uh, what, what has happened over these three years with the disciples is this. They've made the details of life greater than Bible doctrine. And they don't realize it. Now they've been with the Lord and they've been with Him every day. And they've stuck with Him and they've listened to His ministry and they've listened to doctrine. But they haven't gotten to the point yet where they say doctrine's number one. They're still worried about the details of life. Why do they scatter to the wind? Because they're worried about the detail of survival. They want to survive. They don't want to be killed. With They said they wanted to back in verse 35. You remember that. They all were saying, we'll die with you. But then when push comes to shove, they all take off running. They don't want to be killed. And from the human viewpoint, it's understandable that they don't want to be killed. But the reason they're functioning under human viewpoint is because they never made doctrine number one. And when our Lord would speak for hours upon hours, they would pick a few things up, but uh, doctrine wasn't number one. Doctrine was just another detail to them, in other words. And they all had the details of life that they worried about. Uh, Peter, a lot of times, liked to worry about food. Remember, he would get hungry and say, where's the fish and where's the bread? I'm hungry. And I could imagine Peter being very active and very, uh, in his youth anyway, very active and uh, very hungry all the time. And just uh, uh, that kind of person, like a football player, always hungry, always needing food. And uh, so Peter would start uh, perseverating on the details of life. And just like we could uh, perseverate on the details of life, maybe a TV show uh, piques our interest more than the Word of God. And maybe uh, something else piques our, there's something comes in conflict with the Word of God, and uh, the, we would rather do that than listen to the Word of God, whether it be on tape or face to face or however you get it, you would rather do something else. And this is a conflict that we all face. It was a conflict that the disciples faced. And for the first uh, three years, while Jesus was on the earth, they failed miserably. They always got their eyes on the details of life. Always. And they couldn't even come to understand why our Lord had to go to the cross. Now, Mary of Bethany understood why He had to go to the cross. And she didn't have her eyes too much on details. 
because she spent a lot of money on that oil and uh, obviously she wasn't very wealthy but she spent a lot of money on that oil and anointed our Lord and had no two thoughts and didn't even worry about it, didn't think about it then was criticized about it but didn't even say anything this was someone who was mature and had her eyes on the Lord and she didn't have her eyes on other people and definitely didn't have her eyes on the details of life So the principle that comes out of this, what we see here between the fact that Matthew talks about the Lord and then Matthew talks about Peter and then Matthew talks about the Lord again is the fact that he's contrasting, comparing and contrasting our Lord who uh, knew the plan of God, of course, and was going to follow it and uh, had made Bible doctrine number one in his humanity. You know, he had to grow in grace and knowledge just as we do in his humanity. And he did. He grew in grace and in knowledge among God and among men. And therefore, uh, he did not have his eyes on the details of life. If our Lord had had his eyes on the details of life, he would have never went to the cross. But of course, such thoughts are blasphemous. So, he went to the cross. Yet, everyone around him made the details of life their criteria. Now in 2647, while he was still speaking, Jesus was still speaking. You know, he told him, he said, uh, get up and get going, look. Or, or get up and get going, let us go, look, my betrayer is here. And as he was saying this, and along with a few other things, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him, I want you to notice this, And with him a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest and elders of the people. From the chief priest and elders of the people means that religion instigated this. Religion instigated this uh, violent arrest of Jesus Christ. And that's because religion is the devil's ace trump. Religion is the worst thing that's ever happened to humanity. And religion is the most blinding thing that's ever happened to humanity. And so religion gets this mob together and it's a mob of people. There may have been some Roman soldiers there and there may have been some centurions and there may have been some Jewish police there as well. But this is just a mob of people with swords and clubs We've heard about people going out and looking for a criminal with pitchforks and uh, torches. Well, this is this type operation here, a type of vigilante operation. And it's a crowd of people, an actual mob, a mob of people led by the chief priest and elders of the people, elders meaning leaders. Now, why did they need such a large crowd? Jesus is one man, just one man. And he's in a he's in a uh, park praying. He's not bothering anybody, and yet they think they need this large crowd with swords and clubs. Well, there's several reasons why they did this. First of all, Jesus was strong physically, and they knew that it, that if he were to put up a fight, he's not. But if he were to put up a fight, they knew that they would need a large army of people to to hold him back and to keep him down because they remember what happened at the uh, temple. And their memories weren't too short about that because that involved money and a lot of them lost money and so they were mad and so they remembered that and they remembered how strong our Lord was physically. And secondly, they were scared of him. They were scared of the Lord. They didn't believe that He was the Son of God, but they knew that He had some powers because they had seen miracles. Yet, even though they had seen all these miracles, they didn't believe that He was the Son of God. Uh, But uh, they had some doubt in their mind. Therefore, they had to bring a lot of people because they thought to themselves, well, if He is the Son of God, He could just zap us all out. So uh, if we bring enough, maybe we can subdue Him. But they didn't really think he was the son of God. And they thought that, uh, well, they do like a lot of people. They think there's safety in numbers, just like gangs. When gangs get together and start roaming the street and start uh, pestering people, they think there's security in numbers. You get one of those gang members alone, 
and uh, you have one man with a gun and he doesn't have a gun, he's going to run uh, like a coward. But you get a gang of people together with a bunch of guns and they can terrorize everybody because they think there's security in numbers. That's the third reason. They think there's security in numbers. 2648. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I kiss is the man. So Judas is going to go up and kiss Jesus Christ. So it, uh, it's dark outside. See, it's nighttime and uh, the crowd is going to be behind Judas. They're not going to know exactly which one is Jesus, but Judas knows because Judas has been around Jesus for three years. And Judas knows where Jesus is going to be because uh, he had been through other Passovers with our Lord. And he knew that the Lord loved this part called Gethsemane. And he knew that that's where the Lord loved to pray and teach his disciples. It was a private place. And he knew that the Lord loved to go to this park, so Judas knew he would be there. And Judas, and this was his opportunity to betray Christ. So the betrayer had given them a sign, the one I kiss is the man. Then he says, hold him tight. This is Judas', Judas command to uh, the people who are going to uh, capture him once he lays on the kiss on the cheek. It's on the cheek, by the way. That's how they did it in the ancient world. So he went up and kissed him on the cheek, and then he said, hold him tight. Why would Judas make such a uh, request? He was scared. Judas is a petty person and he's scared that Jesus Christ would seek reprisal. Why? Because Judas would seek reprisal in a situation like this. If somebody betrayed Judas, he would immediately seek reprisal. He's a petty man. He's an unbeliever, first of all, and he's also petty, but you don't have to be an unbeliever to be petty. There are enough uh, believers that are just as petty as unbelievers. And what, what petty people do is they lower themselves to, or they lower anyone that they're in competition with or in conflict with, they lower that person to their level. So he actually thinks Jesus Christ might have reprisal on him. But Jesus Christ is going to leave everything in the hands of God the Father. He's not going to seek reprisal on Judas Iscariot because he knows what's going to happen to Judas Iscariot. He's already mentioned it before. And he said it'd been better if you hadn't even been born. He already made it known. And so he's not going to seek reprisal. Oh, he's going to get reprisal because he's going to spend eternal, eternity in the lake of fire. But that's not really the, why he receive, He doesn't receive eternity in the lake of fire because of reprisal. He receives it because he never believed in Jesus Christ. And this man has had opportunity after opportunity to believe. Yet he never has. So Judas Iscariot feared reprisal. And um, he kissed him. He kissed our Lord, and a kiss means, in the ancient world, it means a, it's a sign of recognition. That means he recognized the Lord, that, uh, well, he had been with him for three years. It was a sign of recognition, sometimes a sign of praise, when you uh, kiss someone on the cheek. And in the uh, ancient world, man would kiss man on the cheek, and woman would kiss woman on the cheek, and... Uh, it didn't mean anybody was gay. That's just the way they did it. It's like a handshake that we use today. We handshake, which is I think is better. But back then, they would kiss each other on the cheek. And in the Arab world, they still they still do it that way. Kiss each other on the cheek, one side and then the other. And so this is what Judas does to uh, Jesus. And it's a sign of recognition, first of all, to receive this kiss. Yet uh, Judas is being hypocritical. Judas doesn't recognize Jesus Christ as the unique Son of God. He recognizes Him as rabbi, as a teacher, as a master. doesn't recognize Him as the Son of God, the unique person of the universe. So he's being very hypocritical. Then in 2649, you see, he said, hold him tight. He was looking for reprisal. But then uh, Jesus is about to, uh, it probably really shocks Judas. 
It shouldn't shock Judas, after all, that, that he's seen. But since he's an unbeliever, he hasn't really recognized or understood anything that has gone on. And so this probably shocked him. Immediately, he came to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. That means uh, uh, your Bibles might say Master. It's Teacher. It means... Uh, it means a teacher, usually teacher of the law like the rabbis, and kissed him. And he didn't say Lord. All the other disciples would say Lord. Greetings, Lord. Good morning, Lord. How are you, Lord? That would recognize his deity. But Judas says Rabbi, along with all the other unbelievers who were at that time saying Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, and this is what's going to take Judas aback, Jesus said to him, Associate. Your Bibles might say friend. But notice it doesn't say anything regarding family. It doesn't say brother. It doesn't say son. Nothing regarding family. You see, when uh, Jesus Christ uh, recognizes believers... You know, he does like he did with uh, the fact that uh, they said, Hey, your mother and your brother's outside and they are seeking you. And he would say, These aren't... Uh, you want to know who my mother and my brothers are? It's this family, the disciples, the eleven here. But, in this case, he doesn't say brother. He doesn't say son. He doesn't use any type of familial recognition. So Judas is not in the family of God. And really in the Greek it says associate. Jesus said to him, associate. Do what you are here to do. Now in the King James, I think it says, I think it uh, asks a question and it says, What are you, why are you here, or what are you doing here? Well, Jesus, Jesus knows why. Now that's just a mistranslation. Now Jesus isn't an idiot, and he doesn't look at uh, uh, Judas and say, uh, Friend, what are you doing here? And that's stupid, because just before this, he's talking about the fact that his betrayer's here. So you can tell that they didn't get the Greek right. And the Greek here is simply this. The Greek is, uh, what it comes out from the Greek, is this. It says, what well, when I lost my greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him, Associate, do what you are here to do. He's not asking a question. He's just telling Judas, Hey, do what you're here to do. And that must shock him. In other words, run your little errand, boy. Run your errand and uh, uh, get your 30 pieces of silver. Then they came and seized Jesus violently and arrested him. And they did it with violence, and they arrested him with violence. But one of those, 2651, okay, the correct translation, 2650, Jesus said to him, Associate, do what you are here to do. Then they came and seized Jesus violently and arrested him. 2651, but one of those, this is where Matthew leaves out the name Peter. This is Peter who actually does this uh, here, but he leaves it out. He's not going to mention Peter because he's writing in 68 A.D. and Peter's still alive. But one of those, Matthew omits Peter's name because Peter was still alive when he wrote it. And by the time John wrote, it, wrote his account, it was uh, 96 A.D. and Peter was already dead. But one of those with Jesus grabbed his sword, drew it out, and struck a soldier. The soldier's name is Malchus. Jesus grabbed his sword, drew it out, and struck a soldier of the temple guard, cutting off his ear. And this was Peter who did this. And where did he get the sword? Well, it was his, probably. And what this shows, it shows many different things. Peter remembers what he said back in verse 35. And Peter remembers saying that, uh, I am willing to die with you, Lord. 
Peter remembers saying this at this time. And he was sincere about it. And in fact, he's so sincere and he's so emotional that at this point when he sees them arresting Jesus, he just pulls the sword out of his sheath, probably a Makari, and he pulls it out from probably behind his shoulder and whack, slices off Malchus's ear, which shows he's a bad shot. <laughs> He wanted to kill the man, but he's so emotional, and when you're emotional, you don't really, uh, you're not very accurate in your throws or in your punches. If you ever get in a fight, make sure that you're cool headed. Or at least, uh, try to be cool headed. And try to think about, uh, where you're gonna punch. Punch in the solar plexus, knock the wind out, and then punch him in the face. uh, While they are immobilized. And there are other ways, if you've studied fighting, how to do it. But Peter's so emotional, he just pulls it out and right and hits his ear. He wanted to split his head in two, but he got his ear instead. And so the soldier's ear flops off. And then, uh, of course, uh, Jesus puts it right back on, and that probably shocked Malchus. Uh, Malchus probably uh, thinking... Uh, he's one of the soldiers and he's probably thinking, man, I just lost an ear for this stupid uh, event. And then Jesus just slaps it back on. You might not see that here in Matthew, but it comes out in Luke and in other uh, places. So, but one of those with Jesus grabbed his sword, drew it out and struck a soldier of the temple guard cutting off his ear. So Peter was emotional. We know this is Peter from uh, the fact that we get it from the uh, uh, the uh, John. We get it from the Gospel of John. And Peter was very emotional. And he was very sincere. And he wanted to save Jesus. And if you think about that, that's pretty arrogant. Uh, I will save Jesus. Jesus is the one who saves us. We don't save Jesus Christ. And he's going to save Jesus because he has said, and back in verse 35, he has already said, I'll even die with you. So he's trying to live up to what he said. He remembers what he says at this point. He's trying to live up to it. And he's saying, I'm going to prove it to you, Lord. And off goes the ear. But then he gets... uh, berated by the Lord as soon as it happens. In 26.52, Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place. So it was his sword. And it was probably uh, behind his shoulder. And it says, And he says, Put your sword back in its place. For all who take hold of the sword will die by the sword. Now this means that uh, Peter was about to commit murder. They were uh, going to arrest Jesus. He was a soldier. He was just following orders. As a soldier, Malchus, as a soldier, was following orders and he was going to arrest Jesus. He knew nothing about anything else except that he had an order. Arrest Jesus. And then Peter's going to kill him. Well, if if Peter would have succeeded, he would have been guilty of murder. He would have murdered a soldier uh, doing what he was asked to do. And the soldier didn't know Christ. But I'm sure, but uh, all, the all possibilities are after his ear was reattached, he believed in Jesus Christ. But then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place for all who take hold of the sword. This means to murder. And murder will die by the sword. And that means will die as a result of capital punishment. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And a lot of uh, criminals uh, live by the gun and they die by the electric chair. Same principle. And it's capital punishment. We don't use capital punishment enough. Uh, We started to use it a little more as of late. Texas uses it a lot, and that's good. But uh, uh, some northern uh, states don't use it at all. But capital punishment is part of it, and this is what our Lord's talking about. If you murder, uh, you're going to die. If you murder somebody, you're going to go and receive capital punishment. And even if the state doesn't give you capital punishment, God may give you capital punishment. 
So this is definitely not a reference to warfare, by the way. Uh, the people in Iraq shooting to kill the enemy, the insurgents, they're actually terrorists. The media has called them insurgents. The media is an enemy of the United States as far as I'm concerned, although they do have the freedom to say what they wish. They, they, they do not reflect anything of freedom, and they do not reflect anything of the truth that's going on over there. The only thing they report is bad news, and, uh, and uh, that's just the nature of the business, I guess. Uh, but they are anti-American, and uh, sometimes it's almost with glee they report. Uh, it's nearly 2,000 Americans are dead. Maybe this will hurt George Bush. And that's all they're interested in, and they don't care. They they probably wish ten thousand Americans would die so that they could blame it on George Bush and win some political points. And all of that is gross, but uh, so is all of politics anyway. So Peter, so what happens here is uh, Peter almost murdered somebody, and uh, our Lord tells him, "Don't do this. Thou shalt not murder." Remember that command, Peter. And that's what he says to him. And then he says in 2653, and this should make Peter feel stupid, <laughs> Or do you think that I cannot call on my father and that, he would, and that he would send me more than 12 legions of angels right now? Here's Peter in his sincerity, in his emotionalism. I'll die for the Lord. Rawr! And slices off an ear. Then our Lord has to gently correct him. And our Lord says, Don't you think that I could have called on my father? In other words, Peter, if I wanted to get out of this situation, I could get out of this situation. You know, uh, Jesus Christ, if he, if he wanted to get out of the situation and he did not want to go to the cross, he could have relied on his deity. And he could have blew a fire out of his mouth and shoot bolts of lightning out of his ass and consume everybody. And yet, uh, I got that from Braveheart, by the way. But uh, he didn't do that. He didn't do that because he's going to the cross. And he know he has to go to the cross. And so what Peter's doing is Peter is taking the situation, or he's trying to take the situation out of the Lord's hands. You say, I'll take care of you, Lord. Step out of the way. That's what a lot of believers do today. When, a believer, when another believer gets out of line and you try to straighten them out, what are you trying to do? You're getting in the Lord's way. The Lord will straighten them out. And uh, when we try to straighten other people out in any way, except for our children, I don't have children, but if you have children, you have that right. But except for your children, when you try to straighten other people out, uh, you are taking them out of the Lord's hands. Or when you gossip about somebody, you take them out of the Lord's hands. Or when you judge somebody, you take them out of the Lord's hands. Well, well Peter is just taking this whole situation out of the Lord's hands. And the Lord tells him, look, if I wanted you to do anything, uh, uh, don't you know I don't need you? What Actually, what he's saying is, I don't need you, Peter. I could call on angels. You don't even know how to shoot straight. You can't even, the only thing you do is lop off an ear. You can't even do anything. I could call on angels and they would consume everybody. And uh, you're, In other words, uh, Peter, you're being stupid. Now, he was sincere. And he was emotional, and he loved the Lord, and he was very sincere about saving the Lord. And we would think, oh, poor Peter, he really wanted to uh, do something in the situation. But he was wrong. And sincerity doesn't mean you're right. Oftentimes, sincerity shows weakness and lack of doctrine. And Peter had a lack of doctrine. And that's why he did this. Then in 2654, our Lord is going to teach Peter this doctrine again. And he's been tell she's been trying to tell Peter over and over again, and we've seen this all through Matthew. He's been trying to tell Peter, he's been saying, Peter, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die as a substitute for the world. And then Peter will say, oh no, Lord, you're not going to die. And then Jesus would say, get behind me, Satan. I'm going to the cross. And then again, he would bring it up. In two days from now, I'm going to the cross. 
And then he would bring it up at Gethsemane while he was praying. And he would, he would say, you keep watch and pray because I'm about to go to the cross. And through all of this, I guess Peter just doesn't believe it. So again, he has to teach him something. And he says, how then would the scriptures that say the cross must happen this way be fulfilled? How then would the scriptures that say this, your Bibles might say this must happen, that means the cross. How then would the scriptures that say the cross must happen this way be fulfilled? In other words, if Peter had known Scripture, if Peter had known that Jesus Christ had to go to the cross, he wouldn't have been trying to cut off people's ears. He wouldn't have been acting in this manner. And Peter is functioning under satanic viewpoint. And he is trying to prevent our Lord from going to the cross just as Satan tried to prevent our Lord from going to the cross. And when you don't have Bible doctrine, you're going to operate under satanic viewpoint. And when you have not made Bible doctrine number one, you are going to operate under satanic viewpoint. And when the details of life uh, become more important than Bible doctrine, you are going to have satanic viewpoint. And this was Peter's problem at this point. Later on he grows up. Later on he realizes it. But he's been with the Lord for three years and he just hasn't listened to a thing he said. He's been there, but he tunes him out or goes to sleep or something else. Who knows what he's been doing, but he just hasn't learned a thing even though he's been there for three years. And he's operating under satanic viewpoint because he's trying to prevent our Lord from going to the cross and to do so would prevent us and him from receiving salvation. Definitely satanic. 26.55 At that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me like you would a robber? Now, our Lord wasn't going to fight back, but He's going to make a statement. And He's going to make a statement that makes people think. Our Lord's always interested in making the wheels turn in people's head and heads. And that's why He always has been so upfront and has been so plain spoken. Because plain speech is the best speech and you might as well put it out on the line so that at least people can think about it. Don't shroud your speech. Uh, Make sure that people know uh, what you stand for and where you're coming from and who you are. And that's what the Lord does. And he's not scared of people. And he's about to go to the cross and he's not scared of this crowd. So he asks them a question in order to pique or some interest because there are some Roman soldiers there and there are others there who will later come to believe in Christ. And so he asks them a simple question. Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me like... Uh, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me like you would a robber? Day after day, I sat teaching in the temple courts, yet you did not seize me. In other words, if I were committing crimes, and if sitting in the temple courts as I was, was a crime, why have you waited till now? If I was a criminal, and everything that I was doing was criminal, why didn't you arrest me at that point? Why, did, In other words, why didn't you take me red-handed? You know, they caught him red-handed in the temple, saying that the temple will be destroyed and it will be raised again in three days. And that's exactly what he said. And what he's saying is, uh, if what you're arresting me for is worthy, why didn't you just do it And while uh, you could have caught me red-handed? That's what he's saying. But they didn't. Uh, they waited until uh, he was alone in privacy. And then they uh, attacked him and uh, caught him at night time. Then he goes on to say in 2656, But all this happened so that the scriptures of the prophets would be fulfilled. So the reason why all of this is happening is so that the, the, the uh, Bible doctrine will be fulfilled. And he's going to go through all of this. 
And he's going to go through the, all the different trials. And Matthew's going to start with the second trial uh, coming up pretty shortly here in 2657. He starts with the second trial. The first trial is covered in John uh, 18, 12 through 24. And Matthew recognizes the second trial. And there are several different trials that our Lord goes through. This one's going to occur at night time. This trial is, and uh, which means they do it in secrecy, and they have, and they try to stack the deck against our Lord, etc. They violate all of Jewish law and what they're about to do, and they have to to get a guilty verdict. They're going to stack the court against him, and they're going to violate everything in Jewish law, such as having uh, two witnesses. Uh, to go against you who are uh, not associated and who have the same message yet have not cooperated with each other, yet they cooperate even though they may be in different states or in uh, in, in two different places. And But they're not going to follow the law. They're not interested in the law. They're interested in uh, making sure our Lord goes to the cross, which is where he wants to go. Well, he doesn't want to go, but that's where the plan of God has him going anyway. Then all the disciples left him and ran away. All of them. And remember back in verse 35, all of them said, We'll all die for you. Well, Peter said it first, then they all chimed in. That's true, Lord. We'll all die for you. We're not going to let this happen to you. We will all die for you. And it was all emotionalism. And emotionalism doesn't carry you. Bible doctrine carries you. And Peter didn't have enough Bible doctrine. He had a lot of emotionalism. And he was brave enough to cut off a soldier's ear without even thinking about the consequences. Those uh, Roman soldiers, like Malchus, were trained so well, but I'm sure Malchus was in shock. But uh, they were trained so well that uh, if, if, if he were uh, ready for battle, and uh, Peter just runs up and swipes off his ear, the next thing Peter knows, his head is laying on a platter because the Roman soldier just comes back and goes, Whack! and that's it. But the Roman soldier didn't do that. Roman soldier was probably in shock because uh, he probably knew it was uh, going to be a peaceful arrest. He probably had it settled in his mind. Nothing's going to happen. I've seen this man, Jesus. He's just going to go away with us peacefully. That's probably what he had in his mind. And then when he, his ear flops off, he gets a little shocked. And then when uh, his ear is put back on immediately, he's even more shocked. So he didn't have time to kill Peter. But he would have killed Peter uh, if uh, if our Lord would have let him go on in that manner. And Peter would have died. And he would have died and sent unto death. But uh, he was spared. And, um, and this time, the first time, he's so emotional, he's ready to uh, die for Christ, just like he said. And now what's he doing? He's running. He's running with all the other ones. Then all the disciples left him and ran away. They all ran away. Now Peter, we'll see a little later, is going to follow from a distance. And Peter's interested in what's going to happen. And as a result, uh, people are going to recognize Peter and then he's going to deny Christ three times just as our Lord said he would. So we see how Matthew switches back and forth from uh, what our Lord did to what uh, happened with Peter. And the reason why is Matthew is showing us that the Lord used the prototype spiritual life. He used Bible doctrine. And the Lord was very calm through the whole situation. He knew it was going to happen. He was ready to go to the cross. And uh, nothing was going to stop him from going to the cross. And the whole way he's uh, preaching doctrine. And he's filled with doctrine and that is what sustains our Lord. Now all this emotionalism and all of this uh, uh, sincerity that Peter has does not sustain Peter. Neither does it sustain any of the other disciples. So Peter uses emotion. Jesus Christ uses doctrine. Peter makes emotion his God. Jesus Christ makes doctrine his God. And the last words that Jesus Christ says on the cross are found in the Psalms. 
And what he says, the last three wor- or four words are, or a little more than that maybe, O oh, Lord God of doctrine. Then he breathed his last. His last word on the cross was doctrine. And that is what sustained our Lord. And that is what Peter doesn't have. And that's why he's not sustained because he's too worried about the details of life. He's too worried about survival. Yet it's already been made clear that uh, uh, even uh, bread is not as important as the Word of God. You shall, li- you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's Bible doctrine. So now Peter's all worried about uh, saving his own skin. That's a detail in life, really, for him at this point. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to understand uh, the predicament of Peter and to understand how our Lord handles this situation so that we can come to uh, understand more clearly the importance of doctrine and how sincerity is not the issue but positive volition toward doctrine, growing in grace and in knowledge is the issue so that we might glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.